Now that we've learned how to classify bonds as far as ionic or covalent, we need to learn how to name them. Now with an ionic naming system, there are a few simple steps that you got to follow. First, you're going to write the first symbol's name. That first symbol is usually your metal. Then you're going to write the beginning of the second symbol's name, usually your nonmetal. And then you will add IDE as a suffix to the second name. So if you look at NAF, we know this is ionic because we have a metal with a nonmetal. Now I need to name it. The first name is sodium. And according to the rules, I simply rewrite the name of the first symbol. I'm going to take the beginning of the word fluorine, fluor, and then I'm going to add IDE to the end as a suffix. Now, it's going to take some practice getting used to where to stop the nonmetal's name. So nitrogen will be nitride. Oxygen would be oxide. We'll practice those more in class. But the idea is you take the first syllable and drop the end to add the IDE. If you consider what we do in our culture when a woman and a man marry, the woman will take the name, the last name of her husband. That's our convention. So when I was married, I took my husband's last name and I was no longer Michelle Farah, I became Michelle Smith. I took his last name and attached it to my first name. So ionic bonding by adding this IDE to the end of this second name lets us know that these two chemical atoms or elements that were separate are now combined as one new product. Now sometimes your ionic bonds will have polyatomic ions. A polyatomic ion by definition means many atoms. So what you're going to do is you're going to look for a bond that has three or more symbols. If you have three or more symbols, then you know that you have a polyatomic ion present. So if you see NaO and H, those are three different symbols. All you're going to do is name this just like you would an ionic bond, but you're going to make sure that you leave the polyatomic ion the same. You're simply going to write its name the same. Do not change its name. So the trick is to identify the polyatomic ion. That's the reason we're going to memorize the polyatomic ion chart that will be provided in class. So OH is hydroxide. I just rewrite it here in the name. I write sodium for Na because the rule is to write the name of the first element. So this NaOH is sodium hydroxide. Now in my next example, my polyatomic ion is in the beginning. I'm going to take that NH4 and write its name, ammonium. Then I'm going to follow my rules for naming an ionic bond. I'm going to take the beginning of the second name, chlor, and then I'm going to add IDE. Now if the polyatomic ion is at the end, I don't change this word to IDE. I keep it as the polyatomic ion name. So SO4 is sulfate. Na is sodium. So Na2SO4 is sodium sulfate. That 8 lets me know it's a polyatomic ion. Another thing that can happen with ionic bonding is I could have a transition metal instead of one of my other alkali or alkaline earth metals. When you have a transition metal, we're going to need to add a Roman numeral to the name of the metal. We do that because these transition metals are something that's called polyvalent. They can have multiple 
charges on them depending on the situation that they're in. So we use this number, this Roman numeral, to tell the charge on the metal. Not how many atoms of the metal I have, but the charge on the metal. So when I see in writing copper 2 chloride, that 2 tells me that copper has a positive 2 charge. And so then I can write the rest of the um, compound as CuCl2 copper chloride is copper 2 chloride. The 2 is not how many coppers I have, it's the charge I have on the copper. So if I saw a formula, Fe2O3, the way to figure out the charge to go backwards is to take your crisscross method and go backwards with it. This 3 came from the charge on the metal. So I just take that up and give that positive value there and iron is a charge of positive 3. The oxygen is a charge of negative 2. So my name for Fe2O3 is iron 3 oxide. Now notice I don't need Roman numerals on the elements that are not transition metals. It's only on the 2 that came from the transition metal section of the periodic table. Now there are two different kinds of acids that we will be looking at. The first type is when you have hydrogen combined with oxygen plus something else, like HNO3. The proper way to name this type of acid is to take the something else, the beginning of its name, and place it in the blank. And then you simply add ic acid. So HNO3 is nitric acid. If I have a hydrogen with a halogen from group 17, then that is going to be in this format, hydroic acid, like for example, HCl. HCl is a hydrogen with chlorine from group 17. So I take the beginning of the word chlorine chlor and add it to the blank. Hydrochloric acid would be the name for HCl. All the other slides that we've looked at so far were different examples of ionic bonding. The transition metals, the polyatomic ions were all part of ionic bonding. So was the acids. Now we're going to talk about the covalent naming. Covalent, remember, is when the electrons are shared. And when we are going to name a covalent bond, we're going to follow the same rules as an ionic bond with one very important exception. We will add prefixes for the number of atoms present for each symbol. The only time you will not add a prefix is if your first atom only has one, then you will not write mono. So here are our prefixes. Mono is one, di is two, tri is three, tetra is four, penta is five, hexa is six, hepta is seven, octa is eight, nana is nine, and deca is ten. Now, let's look at a couple of examples. I have CO2 and CO. If I were to follow my ionic ruling, or my ionic naming rules, both of these would be named carbon oxide. I would take the first name of the first element, carbon. I would take the beginning name of the second element, oxygen, and I would add ID, E. So this would be carbon oxide, and so would this. Well, the problem is one of these is something that we have around us every day, and the other one is an odorless poison gas to our system. So it's important to know the difference. Well, according to the rules, because I have two oxygens here, I need to add the prefix di to the oxide. 
That tells me I have two oxygens, carbon dioxide. Now, I don't have a mono here because the rule says never put mono on the first atom. So it's carbon dioxide, not monocarbon dioxide. But notice I do have a mono in my second example. I have mon oxide. Carbon is still without the prefix mono, but because I only have one oxygen, I'm going to call this carbon monoxide.